Schools and housing were the main topics in the State of the City Address, and they're the main focus of our guests from the Boston City Council with some thoughts on setting an agenda for Boston. Are the councillor from District 7 and chair of the Education Committee, Tito Jackson, and from District 8, the chair of the Housing Committee, Josh Zakem. Uh, thank you both. Very Thanks much for having us. There. Thank you. I'll start with the Councillor Jackson. Start with the chemistry, the projection in, in this year's address as opposed to last year. Remember a year ago when the Olympics were coming, there was some mm -hmm. euphoria about that still, and now yeah. it sounds like a pep rally for the Boston Public Schools. Um, it, it does, but um, the, the thing that we're missing uh, with uh, at, at this pep rally is that someone forgot to bring the money. And so there's a $50 million gap in uh, the Boston Public School funding. Um, in a speech last night, you would hear uh, other numbers um, but when you're speaking to parents, uh, in particular parents in high schools, uh, high schools uh, such as uh, Boston Community Leadership Academy, which has a, over a $1 million gap um, the, this year, year over year, um, schools like um, uh, like the O'Brien School, $700,000, Boston Latin School, $700,000. $700,000 translates into, uh, at Boston Latin School, uh, eight teachers, meaning one person per department. Um, at the best school that we have in our city and debatably the uh, best one in the state. So there's a lot that we have to decide this year uh, in our, in our uh, school budget. Um, and uh, we will, uh, Josh and I will uh, actually get to vote on um, these matters at the council. Mr. Sakem, uh, um, last night we did hear a lot about housing, yeah. but not so much about you know, making this a vibrant city late at night for the you know, young <laughs> professionals. There. Well, I think it's two important aspects of economic development of the city. One is we need to have a city that as we're growing, and we're clearly growing here in the city of Boston, it's going to be a place for everyone, that we're going to have housing for working families, for single parent households, for seniors, for young professionals, including those young professionals who we're always hearing about in the late night tea service and a nightlife. So it's, it's all part of the same ecosystem. I think when we are building housing, whether it's in the downtown neighborhoods, many of which I represent, or elsewhere in the city, we need to be doing what we can as a city government. And we have a limited toolkit on ways we can make development more affordable for folks, um, you know, whether it's through um, property taxes, through zoning, through land that the city owns. I think we've seen some great examples of uh, government-owned land, in this case state land down um, by the TD Garden, that uh, one developer is doing almost 240 units, all of affordable housing. That's right in the heart of downtown. So, and that's a partnership, though. That's a partnership between the city between the state, between a private for-profit developer, and uh, between some other agencies, federal tax credits are also involved. So we need to get creative. And the best way to keep Boston growing is going to be making sure that when, whether it's young professionals uh, who are graduating from all of our great schools, um, have the opportunity to stay here, they're not going to be weighing in one hand, great job in an exciting, vibrant city, versus I can have a house with a pool in Austin, Texas for, you know, <laughs> what one bedroom costs in Boston. So we need to do better on that. But I think, um, you know, Tito, my other colleagues on the council, I think the mayor, uh, we've all been working very hard to make development more sustainable in the city. And that's something I plan to continue doing as I chair the housing committee this year. President Jackson, every, everybody agrees the schools need more money. But uh, what about the state's role? And, and what about what the mayor accomplished last night in persuading people like the governor and leaders of the state legislature yeah. to, 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 you know, bring in some of that money? Well, we, we need, uh, as you saw, uh, de Blasio in uh, New York actually was able to weigh on the state, um, and they got 50,000 uh, new um, K-0, K-1 seats. Those are preschool seats. We know that uh, the eight from ages zero to five is when most of the stuff forms uh, up, up here. So it's probably down, it's down for most of us uh, after, after that. Um, and so we definitely, and you heard of a program uh, that was helping uh, folks uh, zero to three. But uh, getting into school at that age, is a huge piece and we need the help of uh, Governor Baker uh, at the state level, uh, not only in Boston, but also as uh, the mayor noted uh, in, gate in Gateway City. So that's a absolutely uh, a critical uh, component to uh, changing the game. In addition, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to make sure that we are closing uh, the achievement gap. And so if we don't fully fund um, the schools, that's an issue. And then the charter component is absolutely critical. Uh, the, state of, uh, the state of Massachusetts gave us about 211 million bucks last year. Um, 104 million went to 8,100 students in charter schools, and 107 million went to 57,000 students in Boston public schools. Of course, we also uh, fund our schools with our, our local uh, our property taxes um, and you know our real estate taxes. But when it comes down to it, um, we are not getting uh, the type of uh, money that we deserve from the state. In addition, um, uh, Josh and I vote on a budget where uh, the city council, as well as the city of Boston, actually has to pay 
for the transportation of parochial as well as uh, charter school students in addition to Boston Public School students. So additional cost, um, but also less revenue um, from the state. Um, that is an unsustainable uh, 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 and impractical way uh, for us to advance and do, do the best thing for our young people and get more GEs because we have smart young people who are coming out of our schools who are really the research and development pipeline that uh, companies like GE uh, want to come uh, and be with. What about the GE deal? If you're outside Symphony Hall, a lot of people, were, they're kind of outraged about you know, giving money to people to move to the Seaport District. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, the mayor says, oh, this is a magnet mm -hmm. for new things that are going to be good for us. Yeah. Well, I think there are two aspects. I think number one is that the city part in that deal, which is certainly nothing that's been set in stone yet, uh, is a cap on property taxes. Uh, on property taxes for a new place. And that's something we often do for economic development, um, projects that we think are going to generate construction jobs, long-term growth in an area. And to be quite honest, I can think of nothing else in the two plus years I've been on the council that has the potential to have such a positive impact. We're talking about nearly a thousand high paying jobs, not only that, you know, not only those jobs that are directly related to GE, but also what we're talking about is, you know, so saying Boston is open for business. This is a hub of technology and innovation. We know that, but GE is a top 10 global company. They're coming here and they're putting their stamp of approval and saying, this is where we want to grow because of the pipeline, because of what Tito is talking about, our pipeline of students, our pipeline of whether graduates of the Boston public schools or of our colleges and universities and research institutions are around here. And I think as we've seen here in the Boston area, um, you see it in Silicon Valley, these ecosystems sort of feed off each other. It's not something that you can just say, we're going to invest in one area or we're going to support one thing and the economy is going to grow. It's that diversification, but it's also you need those clusters, those creative clusters, I think is a, the, um, the sociological term that's been used recently. And you know, I think these are high paying jobs. I think certainly whatever final deal is approved needs to have monitoring and safeguards. I'm certainly not a fan of any sort of corporate giveaways, but where this is something that the city is investing in our future, in our growth, and in the growth of our economy, I think uh, it's quite often worth it. Councilor Jackson, we heard about a couple of schools on the upswing last night, and, and they got a pretty good recognition, but I didn't hear a word about Madison Park. I didn't hear a word about Madison Park because there was not a word spoken about vocational uh, technical education, which are the, the types of jobs that we need to actually physically build uh, these buildings. Uh, Madison Park has now uh, fallen into uh, turnaround status, which is a, a level four school. They were downgraded. School. They were downgraded. Um, um, but I think there's a great opportunity still at Madison Park. They finally have uh, stable leadership um, and two uh, stable leaders, their executive director, as well as uh, the uh, principal. Uh, there. Um, I think they, they have some really good partnerships that they've been building. Um, and I think they're finally, uh, you know, starting uh, it, it, towards the, the pathway that, uh, that they should be uh, moving. Um, I also believe, that, and as Josh brought up, um, I don't think it's an it's a or, um, but it's an and. Um, if, if we are able to do uh, deals on the economic development side, we must fully fund our, our schools. And we are a pretty well-resourced city. Um, when we look at when we all look at our tax bills that we just received, um, we, 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 we all hit we all hit uh, part of uh, the, the lotto or, or, or whatever you want to call it, because uh, my you know, mine went up over 100 grand. I'm sure we, we all are. But when it really comes down to it, um, we need to make sure that we have the resources um, to continue to invest, um, because as, as Josh brought up, the cluster theory is based uh, based on uh, companies wanting to come where there's talent. If that talent uh, is not being produced here, uh, then we have we have a problem. And so we know that the colleges and universities are producing that talent. We want our our high schools, um, our elementary schools, our middle schools, um, one to be upgraded physically because we're a billion dollars behind in the physical upgrades. But we also want learning excellence uh, to actually uh, happen inside those buildings, and we need to fully fund them. Councilor Zegar, what about your district and some of the adjacent neighborhoods downtown? A lot more people living there now. I think we want them to stick around. For for a while, and I guess that means they need the school system too. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is something that uh, my constituents have been clamoring for long before I took office. It's something I've been bringing up uh, to the mayor during our budget meetings and everything else is that we are growing. There's a population that is not just young professionals, it's not just transient people, it's not just, you know, um, childless families, it's people want to stay downtown. You look at the Clarendon Street Playground in Back Bay, the Myrtle Street Playground in Beacon Hill, really anywhere else, and they're packed every day. However, as families, you know, the children become five, six years old, there's a problem. Even if they're getting in to some of our great Boston public schools, some of our K-8s that are, you know, some of the top ones, I think, in the state are just around in the downtown area, 
they still is a problem because no one really wants to have their child on a bus for an hour each way every day, and that's if they're on time. So it's a challenge to, one, have that service available. Everyone, everyone in the city deserves to be able to send their kid to a high-quality Boston public school. So I do want to see um, the physical the capital investments and in growing and creating a downtown K-8. But I think there's a bigger issue also is that when you have a large segment of, this pop, of the city's population, um, including folks who I think are very engaged civically, they're not able to be invested in the Boston public schools the way I think a lot of our other families are because they know that either they're, they're going to move to the suburbs or for those who can afford it, some of them are sending their kids to private schools. So these are folks who are very pro-public education. But if they know that in a few years they're probably going to move to the suburbs because there is not a local option for them, a nearby option to send their kids. There's a little bit of a disinvestment, I think, in these larger conversations we're having about funding and certainly the state's obligation, I think, to step up some more funding for the city of Boston, which whether we're talking about education, transportation, housing, Boston is the economic engine for the entire region. And that includes, that requires investment from everybody. It looks like we have some serious restructuring with these schools because I think the research bureau, municipal research bureau that is, says we got something like 4,000 empty seats. Apparently it says we have lots of kids coming in in the early grades, but they're trickling out later but, on. But I also think that the Research uh, Bureau, if, if they're saying that there's 4,000 empty seats, uh, they're also not taking into account the 4,000 young people who are waiting to get in on the early education side. Right? So there's this conversation, and really to me, um, sadly, um, way more attention that's being paid or advocacy at the State House um, for um, only one group and only one governance structure. We know that all young people uh, need resources to be able uh, to succeed. And so uh, for me to hear that the charter cap and individuals who are pushing uh, a raise in the charter cap, um, that's only one governance structure. And in fact, um, there are some downsides on, on that side around uh, discipline uh, uh, issues that that, that happen um, in, in schools, um, as well as uh, the number of special ed and ELL students. Um, I am I, I'm really troubled that that advocacy is occurring. At the same time, when we're have, we have a $50 million deficit, and uh, those individuals are not saying that we want um, all of our schools uh, to have additional funding, but we only want one, of, uh, one type of school. In addition, I also, I also uh, totally rebuff the, the three suburban lawyers who are suing us um, um, saying that there's a civil rights case um, uh, around uh, this issue of whether or not there's uh, a charter cap um, and, and raising the charter cap. Uh, we are doing uh, a great work in the city of Boston with a diverse workforce, but also uh, with a diverse and, and some of uh, the individuals who need the most. We have way more poverty uh, than you see um, in, in lots of the, the other schools and many obstacles. But you know what? Uh, we serve every single student and uh, we, we do it um, uh, in, in a way that uh, I believe uh, most of our students are advancing on onto the levels that they need to advance to. Dr. Sakum, another issue that you have to deal with uh, is uh, the, the expansion of the uh, off-campus student mm -hmm. population. Sure. Uh, you know, there are people in your district telling the city to get tougher <laughs> on that, and the city seem to be he's sort tough, of, though. He's <laughs> tough, though. Sort of, you know, stepping back a little bit. You know, we're not going to crack down on the overcrowding as yeah. long as the places are safe. Well, you know, I, I definitely disagree with that. I think obviously safety is the most important priority, and I think our inspectional services department is doing a, a very good job of taking care of the safety issues and the sanitary code. But there are bigger impacts. We're not just talking about overcrowding from a safety perspective. Overcrowding also leads to, I think, a lot of negative impacts on a neighborhood, whether it's additional trash out there, whether it's louder parties. I mean, I think just common sense says if you have four undergraduates living together, Sure, they can make some noise, they play some music, but if you have eight of them living together, they're going to have that many more friends coming over Friday night, Saturday night, Thursday night, it could be a Monday night, um, and it's a real problem. So it's not just about public safety, which is certainly the, first, the number one concern, but it's about making sure that we can use our regulatory authority, our zoning, our inspectional services department, our police department to make sure that as these colleges grow, as they generate a lot of good and benefit for our city, um, we also make sure that our residents, whether it's in Mission Hill, uh, the Fenway, Symphony, Alston Brighton, I know we've got some college students South moving over Rock into, uh, you know, all in Council Jackson's district. I hear from our, our colleagues in East Boston and Dorchester that they're having uh, issues along these lines. So we need to be proactive. We need to make sure that, you know, everyone has a right, I think, to live in our neighborhoods and to participate in the city. But that right does, that ends when you're negative impact, negatively impacting your neighbors. Folks who have to get up in the morning and go to work and can't be up all night listening to music and drinking beer. So I, I do applaud 
Um, and the mayor and his team, we've worked with numerous different agencies on this the last couple of years. Councilor Siomo and Alston Brighton were working on additions to the University Accountability Act to try and make enforcement uh, easier and to make sure that our residents in our neighborhoods, um, you know, whether they live next to a college student or a senior citizen, are going to enjoy the same quality of life. Councilor Jackson, uh, there were changes, maybe not exactly the same kind, that are happening in Roxbury right yeah. now, especially with all these development opportunities around Dudley Square. Yeah. It sounded like the mayor was being responsive last night. He, he wants to have this group of people uh, take a look at this and make sure they get it right. Well, I'm glad uh, that uh, the mayor and uh, his team was actually um, uh, wanting to focus on that. We actually have already been focusing on that uh, in Roxbury. We started uh, a convening called Reclaim Roxbury, uh, where we're looking at the governance structure um, around how we dispose of uh, land in Roxbury. Um, many neighborhoods have a neighborhood council. Uh, we are looking for a restart of the Roxbury Neighborhood Council. Also standards in our neighborhood. When it comes down to people building, you, there are there's an issue around unemployment in Roxbury and Dorchester. So we really want to see uh, individuals who live in those neighborhoods be able to work on the job sites that actually uh, are occurring in, in those neighborhoods. Um, and also work with a, 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 live, a livable or a prevailing uh, wage. Um, we also want to be able to uh, organize uh, and uh, be able to share uh, information. So I'm very happy to, to work alongside um, that process, um, but it has to be community driven and we have to listen to the voice of the people who've made these neighborhoods safer. Uh, the B2 police station, which we, we both serve, actually receives the most 911 calls in the whole city of Boston. And that's a credit, that wasn't the case uh, 10, 15 years ago. But that's a credit to uh, the individuals in our neighborhoods and community who are saying, we're not going to, we don't want to hear the noise. Uh, we don't want to hear uh, gunshots. We don't want to hear any of those things. And that they are proactively picking up the phone uh, to be uh, a solution in their neighborhood and in, in their community. So we want that type of activity to occur. And we're, uh, we refuse to be overrun uh, with, with, with folks. And the planning that occurs should be planning uh, and development that actually suits the needs of the people in the neighborhoods uh, and, and, and community. And we can live together, um, but it, it has to be one, a, 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 a living together that works uh, for the neighborhood as well as the communities uh, that people are uh, deciding to develop in. You know, so like, we have this sort of overall sense of direction from the mayor that he, he wants to essentially upzone, mm -hmm. the, the city, you know, let people build more than they used to in the past. Mm -hmm. And you know, in your district right now, there's this proposal for a 35-story building near, near mm -hmm. Brigham Circle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, we need to put that demand mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. Maybe we can take some pressure off the other neighborhoods. So what's wrong with something like that? Well, I think in the abstract, um, you know, talking about ways we can be more efficient uh, with our space makes a lot of sense. But, you know, I think to uh, Tito's point just now, this has to be community-based. We have to be talking, we're talking about growth in the city. We're talking about redevelopment in uh, some of our neighborhoods. We need to be talking about shared prosperity and shared access. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's someone, a uh, project you're talking about on Worthington Street and Mission Hill, that's in a historic, it's adjacent to historic homes that are three or four stories tall. 40 stories with the traffic, with the impacts there. I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Now that's something that I look to my neighbors and our community members and also the planners at the BRA and the transportation department and the Department of Neighborhood Development to talk about those impacts. So I think you'll see on, in my district right now we have I believe four projects that are all uh, above 30 stories that are, were approved with strong community support. So I think folks are not opposed to height per se, but it has to fit in. Now we're talking about some areas in the Fenway, down by the TD Garden, there's a groundbreaking, um, I believe next week, for a large Tower of Boston Properties is doing there. So when there's a collaborative discussion, when the community has their concerns addressed, when we have a responsible developer um, that's willing to work with us as representatives, but also more importantly, with our neighborhood groups, we can have a lot of success. And I think that we've seen that through the uh, over a thousand units of affordable housing that have been uh, started in the past couple years, that over the many thousands more, unit, more units of uh, market rate housing, that's happening. The city's growing and that's great, but we can't let it be run away. We have to be sustainable and responsible about it, and that starts with the community. Professor Jackson, nothing specified last night uh, about no-fault evictions to protect uh, people faced with displacement, but the mayor did say he's going to create this new office uh, 
What did you make of that? Um, I, I think the, the issue of uh, people being pushed out of our neighborhoods, uh, gent gentrification and displacement is something that we all see uh, in our neighborhoods and, and communities. That's not only Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, uh, that's happening in Mission Hill, it's happening, happening in South Boston. And so I, I do believe that the, the mayor uh, and his staff uh, see that as uh, a, an important issue. Um, one of the things that I've actually pushed in, in addition to the no-fault uh, eviction um, has been um, actually having um, vouchers that are created at the municipal level. In Washington, D.C., they've actually created uh, about f for $5 million, you get about 400 vouchers, um, Section 8 vouchers. And that would allow for uh, individuals to actually be, uh, stay in the city and to begin to stabilize uh, those neighborhoods and, and, and communities. So I think there's a lot that we can uh, we can do in that space. Um, and this issue of housing, uh, out of the calls that we uh, that I get, I, I, and I might even speak for Josh on this one, housing is one of the, uh, the top number of calls that we get in, in terms of people um, having issues. And so we need to work together uh, to find solutions together. Thank you both very much, City Councilor Tito Jackson and Josh Zakem.